The year was 1955. The Russian threat loomed large and ominous behind the Iron Curtain. Both superpowers had nuclear weapons, and the Cold War kept the world deeply concerned about the possibilities of nuclear conflict. President Eisenhower and the National Security Council wanted a viable negotiating chip, a sea-based ballistic missile to act as a strategic deterrent against attack. In November of 1955, the Navy was directed to design this deterrent, and the Secretary of the Navy created the Special Projects Office to be headed by Vice Admiral William F. Rayburn, Jr., a naval aviator with a superb reputation. Because there was a lot of opposition within the Navy, too, there, uh, not opposition, there were a lot of differences of opinion. A lot of people thought this cannot be done. There is too much to do. There are too many things that are undeveloped, too many breakthroughs that we have to have. The Navy's goal was to take the Army's liquid-fueled Jupiter missile and configure it to be deployed aboard an underwater nuclear-powered submarine. Red Rayborn quickly determined the liquid propellant concept would not meet the needs of the Navy and authorized Lockheed Missiles and Space Division to proceed with the development of the missile he christened Polaris. In the first 13 months of his appointment, Red Rayburn and his Navy team made huge strides towards their goal. First, swapping the initial volatile liquid propellant design for a safer solid propellant one. In December of 1956, the Secretary of the Navy handed Red Rayburn the responsibility for developing the entire fleet ballistic missile system. He in turn selected a team of contractors and proceeded with the development of the missile system he christened Polaris. The Navy now had in place the proper FBM team elements to design, build, and support a missile system carried by a nuclear-powered submarine. The Chief of Naval Operations issued a requirement for an operational missile to be launched from a submarine by 1965. Another event occurred less than a year later and half a world away, which had a significant impact on the Polaris program. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1. If they had the rocket power to put a satellite in orbit, they had the ability to shower the U.S. with nuclear warheads, or soon would have. This provided the catalyst to accelerate our program. Less than two months later, the Polaris program was officially accelerated by 18 months. These events, plus the highest level priority given to the development of the FBM system by President Eisenhower, gave the contractors the focus and the goal they needed. Contractors worked feverishly over the next few months. Sperry, for instance, was tasked with the inertial navigation system, which presented numerous problems never before encountered. For this submarine to remain secure and undetectable and to ensure accurate aiming of the missiles, the inertial navigation system needed to maintain, moment by moment and for days on end, a precise knowledge of the ship's position without the benefit of any other navigational reference. Dr. Charles Stark Draper was able to develop a working and an accurate inertial guidance system for the missile. Aerojet General developed a new high-energy solid rocket propellant that was compact, stable, and safe for shipboard use, yet powerful enough to launch Polaris into a ballistic trajectory. General Electric designed the computerized fire control system to aim and fire the missile, which obtained the sub's position directly from the inertial navigational computer. Notice the IBM punch cards for targeting. In those days, that was advanced technology. Meanwhile, back at the shipyard, the electric boat division of General Dynamics was busy modifying a Skipjack-class submarine into the first George Washington-class missile-carrying ship. These attack submarines were literally cut in half, then welded back together with a tubular center section added to house the missile tubes. For practically unlimited distances under the water, I consider that she's a new weapon and that she may have just as profound an effect on naval tactics and strategy as the airplane has had on war. Back in sunny Sunnyvale, California, Lockheed engineers were designing and developing the Polaris missile to conform to exacting specifications of physical dimension, weight, and performance. In November of 1957, Westinghouse demonstrated a missile could be launched using compressed air 
by firing a dummy missile from a prototype tube. On 23 March 1958, in Operation Pop-Up off San Clemente Island, Westinghouse proved that the missile could be launched from an underwater tube. In April 1958, SP again accelerated the schedule for Polaris, requiring an A-1 capability for three submarines by 1960. Flight testing of the Polaris AX, or early development series, began at Cape Canaveral on 24 September 1958. There were problems, but these were expected. After all, we were pushing the state of the art on a radically accelerated basis. By the sixth launch on 20 April 1959, full success was reported. After that, hard won success came rapidly. The first surface shipboard launch in August 1959, followed by the first tactical prototype Polaris successfully flight tested in September. The commissioning of the first Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarine, USS George Washington, in December. And the first full system demonstration of shakedown operation as a submerged submarine, USS George Washington, launched two Polaris missiles more than 1,000 miles down the eastern test range. Four and a half frantic years culminated in those successful firings from under the ocean. Weapons launcher, tube number nine is pressurized. Opening the muzzle hatch on tube nine. Weapons, this is launcher, tube number nine, muzzle hatch locked open. Mark. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 25 seconds and counting. T minus 20. T minus 20 seconds. Stand by, 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 FBM patrol. The system was operational. The FBM team proved it could be done and did it five years ahead of schedule, distinguishing the FBM as the most intensive weapon development in the history of the United States. The free world had its answer to Sputnik, the fleet ballistic missile, a deterrent which over the years has only grown more survivable, ready, reliable, and effective. Improvements continued constantly. Polaris A-2 and Polaris A-3 quickly replaced the original Polaris A-1. At SP, Red Rayburn turned over the director's reins to Admiral Pete Gallatin on 26 February 1962. And once A-3 was deployed in the Pacific in late 1964, the global FBM system was fully in place. Our main development task since then has been refinement. In January 1965, the development of the all-new C-3 Poseidon missile was announced. A couple of months later, Admiral Levering Smith took the helm of SP after Admiral Gallatin's three-year tenure. Smith was an SP veteran and a man acknowledged as responsible for turning solid propellant research into missile propellant reality, a significant contribution to the continued success of the FBM program. During Admiral Smith's nearly 13 years as director, today's FBM program was shaped.